This podcast was recorded on traditional Denizal land. Hello and welcome to Before the Peace. I'm your host, Jenna Moreland, and I'm here with my co-host, producer of the podcast, and babysitter of children, Trey Lapashinsky. You have wonderful daughters, and <laughs> they love me because I'm a big teddy bear. Today is the day we get to say we have George Desjardins on the podcast. Woo-hoo! If you're a first-time listener and you're like, why are you guys acting like we know who George is? Well, it's because we've talked about him a lot mm-hmm. on previous episodes. Almost every guest we've had knows who George is. He's a former West Moberly First Nations chief. He's recognized by the elders as keeper of traditional knowledge and history, including genealogy for West Moberly. And man, he has some stories. He also gave me some uh, some wedding advice because when we were recording it, I wasn't married. But now... As th- at this point in time, when we're recording this intro right now, the big boy's locked down. Yeah, he got married. You know those uh, napkin rings that fancy people have? Mm-hmm. That's my ring on my finger. <laughs> That's how big that bad boy is. Yeah, it was so cute. I cried when you kissed her, and then when you guys jumped over the broom, it was just like so you guys and so perfect. I will honestly say it was one of the greatest moments of my life. I had a Aww. wonderful time. It was beautiful. And I love that some emotions came out of me right there without making too many jokes because it's an emotional episode today. Um, more so because we just love George so much. Mm-hmm. We met George in May. Yes, at Healing the Hoop. Yes. And... Um, I would like to give some context to some of the waterworks that happened towards the end of the episode. Uh, The day before this recording with George, I uh, had a doctor's appointment for my youngest daughter and she was um, officially diagnosed with a very rare genetic condition. So uh, when George asks about her, I get kind of emotional. Um, George has a a connection with my daughter as well. He met her for the first time at Healing the Hoop. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's very emotional. Yeah, you guys, like you said, you guys have, have that connection. Mm-hmm. I think he has that connection with your daughter as well. Yeah. He's just a, a wonderful man. Like, in yeah. some cases, he doesn't say a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, when we were around him at Healing the Hoop, he doesn't always say a lot, but you can feel, you will just automatically feel comfortable around him. Like, I didn't even talk to him much at Healing the Hoop. Prior to this episode, I honestly didn't talk to George too much, but I just felt comfortable. Yeah. He's just, you know that he's lived a life that he wants to live, and he's also doing it not just for him and for his community, but for other people as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and he, he works to heal. He's a very spiritual person, and he'll he talk about that as well. Um, yeah, actually, podcast. four days before this recording, I went to a sweat. Um, George hosted it at West Moberly, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. I learned so much from him. I can't really get into too much about it. Um, I learned that the sweat is a very personal journey and that it's not really meant to be talked about. So, um, and that's actually, we get into more of that with George on this episode because we do feel very comfortable with George and kind of asking the harder questions. Um, cause we just want to make sure we're being respectful. We want to make sure we're, you know, respecting the tradition of these ceremonies. Uh, so we, we get into some questions with him about that. I would say that's honestly the the brunt of the episode i mean most of it is about sundance but the but with sundance is there's not a lot george can say yeah what he's revealing in this episode he can say but it's something that i don't believe you can just google no like the experience and and that exact events you know it's it's very special that's why this episode means a lot to us not only the content and what's being told because we're very excited that the listeners, you guys get to hear some of these stories, but it's it's just also really awesome that, like you were saying, we're comfortable enough to ask him this, even if he says he can't talk about mm-hmm. it. And there are some questions, more so on my end, where I've asked them to guess before on questions about ceremonies and um, certain cultural practices. 
because George seems to be, and I believe he is at least one of them in Northeast BC. Um, well, because he is a knowledge ke- or traditional knowledge keeper, is he? Um, he just knows. He's just the he has right so person much to knowledge ask. to exactly. give. Yeah, he's just the right. He just is the right person to ask. We have that comfortability. So a lot of the questions, some of them might be shortly answered, um, and then we move on to the next. But we want you guys to know. And learn along with us. That's the Mm -hmm. whole point of this podcast. Yeah, and (laughs) if you like our content and want to see it continue, and you want to become a supporter of energeticcity.ca, you can head to energeticcity.ca slash before the peace. And when you head there, you'll have all the episodes as well. You'll see our sponsors that we're about to get to right away Mm -hmm. here because we do have to get paid. But speaking about that, if if you want to help out, other than just listening to the podcast or sharing it, and by hey, do what you want. I'm just I'm just saying if you want to throw us a couple bucks, <laughs> you could as well by going to the link that uh, Jenna provided. It will help us out with equipment, it'll help us out with travel because we're not just staying in one spot recording these guests. We're putting in mileage, yeah. Which means in this day and age, spend that gas money at liquid gold, baby. <laughs> so any way you can help out would be awesome. And also, here's the thing. We've been doing this podcast for almost a year. Numbers are good. We know people are listening. But I know we're not perfect. And we have got, like, no emails. Yeah, no, no feedback. No <laughs> feedback at all. We we want to hear from you guys. So yeah. please email before the piece at energeticcity.ca. Send us some. Even if you just want to say, hey Trey, you sound like crap. Jenna's awesome. Please don't do that because I do have feelings I'm a human being. But as an example, that is something that you could put there if you would want to. But there's another way that you can reach out to us. Too. Yeah, you can reach us out to us on socials. So you guys already know that we have Twitter, which is at before the peace underscore, but we now have Instagram, which is at before the peace. So make sure you guys follow us on Instagram. You can connect with us there, send us a message, make some comments. Uh, we want to hear from you guys. And now it's time to get paid. This podcast wouldn't be possible without the help of Troyer Ventures. Troyer's been serving our community and the energy industry with tank and back trucks since 2000. They're built on the principles of hard work, service, and community, and they're proud to offer the financial support to make this program possible. Also, thank you to Epscan Industries, known for building excellence safely, for sponsoring the podcast. And Click, thank you so much for your support. The Cultural Learning and Innovation Circle is a non-for-profit society that offers mentorship, coaching, and training opportunities. Let's get right into it. Here's George Desjardins. So I actually, I wrote something for the audience to hear about the blanket ceremony that I did at Healing the Hoop. And it's just kind of about my experience. And I guess my question to you is, I I want to respect the sacred nature of these ceremonies. But I also know that when we started this podcast, we wanted it to be a journey that the audience would come on with us. So I'm just curious, just after being at the sweat with you a few days ago and you said you were talking about the sacred nature of it and that we shouldn't be talking about it and stuff. So I'm, I just am wondering and I'm curious as to kind of what the line is and, and, you know, if it's disrespectful to talk about it and why. Um, I'm not sure it's really disrespectful uh, to talk about a blanket ceremony because um, the ceremony to some degree signifies your being welcomed into the fold as one of our people, if you will, or the people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's what the blanket is for. Because you're you're wrapped in that blanket. Other than that, uh, I, I that's about really uh, all I c- really understand about it. Okay. Uh, that it's 
when it comes to the sweat then, um, can you tell us a little bit about what it is and the, the significance of it to you? Cause I know we can't talk necessarily about the experience that I had on Sunday, but I would like to talk about like what a sweat is. Can you just explain that to the listeners? Yeah. Uh, in, in real simple terms, uh, a sweat is a uh, prayer ceremony. Um, that mimics uh, um, the mother's womb. As a matter of fact, a lot of the people refer a sweat uh, to being Mother Earth's womb. Um, and and that's how come it's uh, they create try to create the same atmosphere. That's how come it's wet, it's hot, and it's dark. It's Be- very hot. Yeah. <laughs> very hot. <laughs> yeah, that's because that's the way it is in your mother's womb. Um, and it also uh, that connection between the ancestors and the spirit world happens inside. And those are the creator's workers. Uh, what church, a church would call angels. So you talk to them and you tell them what it is that you want or what it is that you want them to do for you and they'll take your prayer or your request if you want to call it that because basically a prayer is just a request uh, asking you know uh, the angels to answer your prayer it's a request basically is what it is and they take it to the creator, and then the creator will, in over time, answer it, uh, or give them direction on what they can do to answer your prayer. Um, so they're his workers. Uh, and you do public sweats. Yeah, what as we well, call right? public sweats. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's anybody can attend, right? Yeah. But you don't, you can't invite anybody specifically. No. Um, in, the, in this sweat, anyways, it's a Sundance sweat. We are not supposed to invite anybody. They're supposed to come under their own free will. And, oh, sorry. I was just going to say every participant who comes to the sweat, it's for the, it's ranging from different reasons, right? A variety of different reasons why they're coming to the sweat. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, anything from uh, receiving help to healing. Uh, the only thing you don't do in a sweat is uh, ask for anything negative to happen. You have to always ask for something positive. So in other words, uh, if an individual hurt you in some way, physically, mentally, emotionally, or even spiritually, you don't ask for revenge. Instead, you ask that uh, the spirits help this individual to become a better person so that they will not hurt others the way he or she has hurt you. And there's reasons for that. uh, Because because of their marching orders from the Creator as to what to do for you. They, They were only told um, that you, uh, they don't know good and bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. They that, just take that, their orders and run with it. <laughs> yeah. They were only told that you need to, an, you know, help this individual answer their prayers type thing or bring their prayers to me type thing. They do not uh, make the difference between good and bad. The good and bad comes from you. So that's how come we are always told, never ask for anything negative, never. Always positive. Because you can really hurt somebody through your prayers, especially if all you want to do is help an individual. I think it's a beautiful ceremony, and I was very grateful to attend a sweat, and I think if anybody has the opportunity to try one, I think they should. Um, I, f I, d I don't know how much really t or what to talk about, <laughs> um, but I just want to say it was a very good experience, and even though like I felt kind of a little nauseous after when I got home... Um, that night I've slept probably the best I've slept <laughs> in like, <life. laughs> I don't even awesome. know how long. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but while I was at the sweat, you were telling me some stories about Sundance, which you just got home from Sundance. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what Sundance is and the significance of that? Okay. Uh, I can only tell you so much. Okay. But uh, basically, it's a, it's a big prayer ceremony that lasts four days. And in that time, uh, as you're praying, how would you say this? You basically have to suffer a little bit. Because what you're doing is you're trying to get the spirits to help you, feel sorry, feel pity for you. And they will help you. Um, again, you ask them, help me in this way. Like for me, uh, I went to the Sundance for a number of reasons, but one of the one of the reasons, main reasons I had was to uh, uh, be able to leave drug and al uh, drugs alone. I mean, not drugs, uh, alcohol. To leave alcohol alone because it was threatening to rule my life, mm. and I knew that was happening. Uh, it was really started to happen about six years prior. And then I met my late wife. And then she, for six years, started to wean me off the alcohol. And it was working pretty good until I met my, uh, my teacher, my mentor, uh, Oliver Shouting. And... He helped me go the rest of the way. And when did you meet him? Uh, in 1998. Okay. Yeah, in spring of 1998, I met him. And that summer, I made the commitment to dance. And that was one of the things that he told me when I made the commitment to dance. Uh, he said, you have to give up alcohol. And... And drugs, unless it's uh, prescription drugs you're uh, uh, using and then you're not abusing them. If you're abusing them, then you have to quit that too because you're altering your, your spirit. Uh, you're, not, you're not using the drugs for healing purposes. Mm. You're using it to alter the mind. Is that a common thing with most ceremonies? Is no booze or, or, or drugs? That I'm not sure, but okay. this this specific with the Sundance yeah this stuff. specific Sundance mm. it is okay. So uh, yeah, uh, the, the the commitment to dance is for four years, 
and you dance every summer, uh, four days every summer, and then every fall and every spring you go through a fast to prepare for the sun dance. Um, and during that whole time, no drugs, no alcohol, especially if you've been a, a drug addict or an alcoholic, which I was at the time when I first started. And you go no food, no, wa no water yeah, for no four food, days. Yeah, no food, no water. Um, a lot of those guys, they, they eat and drink water till about midnight on Wednesday. Okay. Then after that, they're cut off. Four days, well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you're all done to get off the tree. Yeah, they have to break. You have to pull yeah. the piercings out. Yeah. Well, well, with yeah, like you force. Hit, yeah, you hit the end of the rope with force, and your skin has to break uh, to let you go. So pull hard. You yeah. want to do that the first time. You want to. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, what you're doing, they say, is when you hit the end of that rope and you break, you're letting go of your old old life and you're starting a new. Oh. Do you think that's why you didn't have the fear going into it to know that you're going into a new chapter of your life? Like I kinda, think so. Yeah, you had that clear head on, like, oh, hey, this is this is now the new me. This is my new direction after yeah. that point. Yeah. So you've been with Sundance for 23 years every year, and you've been doing this as well every year. You said there has to be a four year commitment, right? What makes you keep going back for the 23 years? If if you can answer that, obviously. Um, one of them is uh, basically uh, to keep up your commitment, I guess, or prayers. Because every year when you get back, when you come back every year, even you uh, you have a different reason why you should do it. And you have to do it for that specific reason for four years straight, right? Am, yeah. am I understanding yeah. that correct? Oh, okay. Yeah. Four years, reason. yeah. Oh, okay. For the same but, cause yeah. kind of thing. But if you don't want to pierce, you don't have to. Oh, okay. It's just some of us leaders continue. If you happen to be lucky enough, which happened to me, uh, to be chosen to be a leader, you can continue piercing every year if you want. Mm. Oh, okay. Or... You don't have to pierce only except for those times when you feel it's a good reason that you need to pierce this year, then you can. Um, and the leaders are the ones that decide whether or not it's a good reason, right? Yeah. They, to, be, uh, to be able yeah. to do the Sundance? They're, they're the, they're, leaders is kind of a misnomer. They're, they're more or less the teachers. Okay. Because they teach everybody how to get through the Sundance. And they teach them about the protocols of the Sundance, including uh, being a lodge keeper, being a pipe carrier, mm -hmm. um, how to conduct certain ceremonies. You get taught all that. Uh, during that four years. And if you can demonstrate that uh, you're capable of running those ceremonies, uh, then nine times out of ten, they'll ask you to be a leader, mm. which is what happened to me. I didn't, I didn't think I was in that boat. <laughs> oh. I wanted to go back and talk a little bit about Oliver because he was obviously a big part of, of your life. How did you guys meet and kind of what was his background? How, you know, how was your journey with him and how much did he help you in your life? Well, he, he, he basically taught me everything I know under the guidance of uh, our Sundance leader, which was Morse, Morse Crow Sr. Mm -hmm. He always used to... He always used to uh, ask him, uh, how's our chief doing? He made sure that I was being taught everything well. And he would tell Oliver, uh, I want you to teach 
I want you to teach that young chief this, or I want you to teach him that. And Oliver would teach me how'd how you, to do how, this. How'd you meet Oliver? Well, we hired a lady to work in our health department in in our in our administration office. In West Moberly, yeah. At West Moberly. Yeah. And she was working with us and then uh or for us, I should say. And one day she was talking about having a sweat. And this was in, a, I think, spring. She had been working for us something like about six months. And this was in the early spring. I'm not even sure if it was April or May. And anyways, she was talking about a sweat and that she was going to go to one. And uh, so I told her, I asked her, can anybody go? And she said, yeah, if you, if you want to come, you, you can come. And uh, so I said, okay. Um I went over and I talked with my late wife and said, hey, you want to go to a sweat? Uh, Anne and her husband, uh, or Anne's husband runs a sweat. I didn't know it was a Sundance sweat. And off we went. We went to the sweat that night and about a, a week, maybe two weeks later, they had another sweat again. So, uh, uh, I went again, and then he was talking about the Sundance. I think it was about the third sweat, fourth sweat maybe. Uh, I started asking him about the Sundance. And then not long after that I realized, or I found out he was a Sundancer. And so I told him, I've always wanted to do a Sundance. And, uh, and right there, and then he asked me why, and I told him. You know, I, I need a little bit of help get knocked drugs and alcohol, or alcohol, I keep saying drugs because I'm used to saying it too. Uh, I need help getting off alcohol. And, uh, I keep having these spiritual dreams and I asked the elders about them. And they told me uh, that's how I found out they were spiritual dreams, by asking the elders about them. What are they? And But they, the elders also told me, uh, if you want to find out why you need to participate in a, in a traditional ceremony. And he's, they said that, uh, but out in the prairies is the only place that they still do traditional ceremonies. Uh, he said the, she said the ceremonies here uh, died with the old people. The last two... Uh, shaman, if you want to call them that, or medicine men, if you want to call them that, they, they're they called different names by different people. Uh, which one, one of them was my grandfather. Uh, he passed away in 74. And his brother passed away, I think it was the early 80s, something like that. Those are the only two that used to do the ceremonies here on an annual basis. And they died. And the church forbid them to do ceremonies. So I never got to see them conduct ceremonies at all. Uh, and, you know, my grandfather, I was 18 years old when my grandfather passed away. 
So I, but I, I've heard him talk about it. My gra- my dad talked about it. My grandmother, mother talked about it. Uh, about doing those ceremonies on an annual basis. But I've never seen it. And with the other nations too, their elders that did ceremonies, they slowly passed away and the church forbade them to pass on the teachings or whatever you want to call them. And so nobody knew how to conduct those ceremonies. So my grandmother and my great-grandfather at the time, when I talked to them about my spiritual dreams, they told me, go to the prairies, but make sure you pick the right ceremony and the right people that's running it. Uh, Because, you know, you you don't want... uh, people who don't really know what they're doing uh, to take you through a ceremony. Because nowadays there's a lot of those kind of people uh, that, that do, do it for profit and not, uh, not necessarily caring whether they help people or not. From the heart. Yeah. And... Uh, so I kind of waited, and then all of a sudden, here's Oliver, and this guy runs a sweat. And just by listening to him talk, you can tell he's doing it from the heart. That the ceremony he does is something he really believes in. I can feel the same from you as well. Oh, yeah? Yes. Cool. <laughs> so I talked to him about the Sundance, and eventually um, he talked about it with me. And uh, he can only tell me so much. And then I thought, this is my opportunity. I've waited 25 years for this. And... Then he left to go do his, the Sundance, and he came back, and in mid-July of 1998, I said, so uh, I've made up my mind. I'd like to do this, so how do I go about it? And he said, well, you have to make a commitment. And he said, you could do it inside the sweat in the second round which was the prayer request round. And that's when I made the announcement that I was going to dance. And from that day forward, he started teaching me, started preparing me. Uh, And 11 months later, in 1999, I danced for my first time. Wow. Yeah. I wanted to know about um, how long he was kind of your mentor for before you started having some, I guess, pupils underneath you who you were teaching. Oh, uh, he took me through the first four years of my dance. Okay. And he was also watching what I do to make sure I'm doing everything right, that I know how to do everything. Because the leaders are kind of testing you, right? Yeah. 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 They they test you. After your first year of dance, they test you, but they don't tell you they're testing you. They'll just say to you, they'll ask you, you know, uh, have you danced already? And if you say, yeah, I danced my first, my first year uh, last Sundance. And then they'll say, well, okay, well. I'd like you to pour this round. And that's all they'll say. They won't show you how to do it. Mm. You have to know how to do it by the time they ask you. So, because one of the things they, they say to you is, as they're preparing you for your first dance, is watch everything I do. Uh, when I talk about a a, a, a protocol or a, a teaching, listen carefully. 
so that you will remember it. And uh, because if you get asked to do something and you can't do it, they won't ask you again. Sounds so stressful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, you have to, they, they'll wait mm-hmm. for you. Uh, uh, um, it might be a while, might be a year, maybe two summers, maybe three, uh, before they'll ask you to do it, try it again. And that includes this, and one of the things he said to me was, make sure you can sing two songs by the time you you first dance. And uh, so that was my one of my real focuses that first year during preparation. Because you take a whole year to prepare, was learning two songs. And he said, then there's two songs you need to sing. One is a piercing song, and the other is the pipe song. You need to sing those two songs, for sure. And uh, so that way, because sooner or later, uh, they will ask you to sing. You know, one of the uh, one of the leaders might come into a sweat, get ready to pour, and he'll say, "George, first song, four starts." And if you can't sing, it'll be a long time before they'll ask you again. Mm. And you got to remember, all the other leaders are in the sweat too, and they'll know not to ask you because you don't know how. So lots of listening ears then. <laughs> oh yeah, oh gosh. yeah, a lot of listening <laughs> ears, and then uh, uh, sometimes you know, I mean, down at the Sundance, I was asked during preparation sweats. Uh, I think I was just being shown off, actually, <laughs> <laughs> because whenever Oliver would would pour, when he was supposed to pour. He would say, I'm going to defer this to to him. Mm. And so I was stuck with having to pour. Or sometimes he'll just ask me, uh, they called me Makoi, which means wolf. Because that's the name my father, my grandfather gave me. And uh, he'd say, Makoi, first song, four starts. Uh, yeah. And uh, and that's all. And then when the door closes, the praying's finished, start drumming and singing. And I think I was just being shown off. <laughs> 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 I know you talked about it earlier with, with ceremonies and uh, getting into Sundance and talking a little bit about the blanket ceremony that Jenna was a part of. My question is, just kind of to expand on that, so each ceremony is essentially... Uh, on a case by case basis, on a ceremony by ceremony basis, on what you can talk about outside of the ceremony. Yeah. So, and I'm guessing that that also ranges too, because some it's more so about the experience that the person is mm-hmm. going through and the spirituality surrounding that specific ceremony. Mm-hmm. But there are some ceremonies that can be talked about, such as the blanket ceremony. Or because uh, I just want the listeners to kind of understand because we've talked about, it, especially with healing the hoop, on you know that's where we're trying to find the balance as as, as we, Jenna talked about no, earlier. We can we can talk to, about the purpose of a ceremony, mm-hmm. okay? Just not the actual experience that the yeah, person had. just okay. not the actual experience uh, of the ceremony. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are certain like songs that are sacred that yeah. can't be, I mean, yeah. heard or like gonna read the Sundance them. songs that I sing. Mm-hmm. I cannot sing them for entertainment purposes uh, publicly. If I get asked to do an opening prayer or an opening to conduct an opening ceremony. I can then sing a prayer song for opening a ceremony or a conference. Something that, because they like, uh, you know, 
First Nations people like opening gatherings of some kind with prayer. And since these songs are prayer songs, uh, we're allowed to sing them. But, but only I am. Um, uh, another sun dancer, like say Terrence, mm -hmm. he can come and join me and help me sing the song. But let's say uh, uh, Jenna became a regular sweat hog and knew the songs. She can't come join us, not unless mm -hmm. I say, Jenna, come help us. It's oh, kind of okay. like what you did with Christy, a healing the hoop for some of the songs. Yeah. You would like tap her in to kind of help you out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so... Even if you're a sun dancer, you're not allowed to sing the songs publicly, uh, except for during ceremonial purposes. So, for instance, say there's, um, just as an example, the city of Fort St. John has a groundbreaking. They have Doig River First Nation come in to do an opening ceremony. They have the song. That song is for that specific moment that can't be kind of outside of the room, and then that only that one person is allowed to, to sing that song. Is that correct? Uh, or does it depend? I, I think it is. Okay. Because um. that's kind of what I've gathered, too, because, like, on the reporting side of things, when we're going to that, I don't record video. Yeah. I just just yeah. from what They're I heard, not. I just don't. You know, yeah. we can take pictures, but as for the actual songs themselves, we can't do anything yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, actually, with ours, you're not supposed to take pictures. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, well, that's something. Uh, yeah, that's that, good that, to know. When you go to the Sundance, it's something... You can't record anything. You can't take pictures of anything. Uh, it's all seeing experience, all of it. Uh, Living in that moment. And yeah. yeah. So you're pretty close with Christy Jordan Fenton, a guest that we've already had on the podcast. And I actually texted her and just asked her, like, what should I ask Jordan? Because <laughs> I'm going to interview him. And she actually mentioned that you and your wife are traditionally matched. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. What does um, that mean? When, when I was, uh, when I first became chief, uh, I had a girlfriend. And within that first year, her and I separated. We went our separate ways. And uh, and then the people started saying, uh, our chief needs a wife. And jokingly, they started lobbying. <laughs> uh, other nations, you know, our chief needs a wife. And then in 1991, we hired a dance troupe to come and do a powwow exhibition dance here. Powwow exhibition or powwow dance is completely different. That's, that's basically general entertainment. Which is... So Powwows are so cool. So if you have an opportunity to go yeah. one, go to one. And, yeah. and there is a difference between an exhibition and there's the competitive powwows as well, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, uh, um, so we have an, an event that we call West Mobley Days once a year. Mm -hmm. And that's when it was, it came about by celebrating the, the treaty days. Uh, during when the treaty was signed and uh, us receiving our annuity payments and stuff like that. Uh, that's what it started out as. And it became its own thing. Oh, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> like and it became, yeah, <laughs> and it became its own thing. 
And uh, so we were, the community was serving the elders and the guests. They were serving soup and bannock. And uh, after the elders from the other nations from around here lined up, they said, guests line up. And of course, the dance troupe were guests. And I went and stood at the head of the line over there in behind the elders um, because I was the chief. And all of a sudden, my council started saying, Hey, does anybody got a woman? Our chief needs a wife. <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold, our guest, the dance troupe, the leader of the dance troupe, a lady named uh, Norma, says, hey, we got a woman for you, and grabs my wife, my wife-to-be, and said, there's this one here. We can, she can, he can have this one. And she was just all embarrassed and everything. She was a redhead and, you know, and real pale, even though she has, uh, she was part Sioux Indian, couldn't tell. <laughs> Blue eyes, the whole nine yards. Anyways, uh, she just turned kind of beet red. And uh, and I said, yeah, okay, I'll take her. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I just, we all laughed. Everybody laughed. And then I thought, what the hell? And I walked back there, eh? And I put my arm around her and I said, come on, if you're going to be my wife, then you got to stand up here with me to get something to eat. And we got in line, we went and sat at the table together, and we laughed about what just happened. And the next day, they were packing up. They were going to leave because they were going home. They came from a, 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 the Louis Bull Reserve uh, over in Muscogee's or by uh, Wetaskiwin. Mm -hmm on the other side of Edmonton, south of Edmonton. Anyways, uh, my sister came along, my sister Laura, and she asked me how I was doing and everything else like this, and I said, oh, I'm doing good. She said, so they're leaving, eh? And I said, yeah. So what you going to do about yesterday? And I said, ah, it's no big deal. It was just a joke, something to do for laughs. And then all of a sudden she said, George, the people that weren't, that were in there didn't take it as a joke. And I said, what do you mean the people in there? And she said, uh, think about who was all in there and I thought about it and it was a room full of elders mm. traditionalists and I just oh my god <laughs> and so I went and talked to Darcy and I said come on let's go for a walk I need to tell you something I need to talk to you for a bit and we went for a walk down by the lake over here. And I told her what that thing yesterday, there was a room full of elders in there that don't think what we did was a joke. And so she said, well, she said, I got an idea. Why don't you come to Alberta with us on a two-week vacation. And uh, and then when you come back without me, you can always say it didn't work. It wasn't meant to be, and they should be okay with it. So I thought, okay, that's a good idea, I told her. Eh? Yeah, we'll do that. And off we went. One year later, we got married. Aww. Oh, my God, it's like a movie. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> That's so, so romantic. <laughs> and uh, and we, we got married in a traditional wedding. Uh, there was no judge. There was no 
a priest. But what it, what, what it was was a, a row of three elders, one Danaza, one Soto, and uh, one not speak English, stood right out here. And uh, announced to the people that we were to be so, so uh, seen as a married couple, and that uh, everybody else hands off with these two in the traditional way. And they drum and they sang the song, a sacred song. I had two RCMPs standing on each side as uh, official guards of Canada in their red churches standing there. Wow. And I asked for one, one from the Chetwin Detachment and one from Hudson Home to, uh, to come and be the government witnesses to this traditional ceremony. And uh, because West Mobley is exactly halfway between Chatwin and Hudson Hope. So I had written the both detachments a letter and, and asked them if they could do that, and they agreed. Well, I'll be damned. The time of the wedding happened, there was freaking RCMP officers running around all over the place <laughs> in, re oh in red surges. <laughs> <laughs> they all came to my wedding. Oh, <laughs> that's so nice. <laughs> and, and not only that, uh, the Canada 125 people uh, that went through that time back in 92, mm -hmm. they were here. They recorded that. And it's written in that book, uh, Traditional Marriage wow. of Chief George Desley and Darcy Brown. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Yeah, in Canada 125. That happened in Canada. And how long were you mar married for? 29 years. Wow. So he, this guy, Trey, is getting married in a few weeks. Do you have any yeah. advice for him? <laughs> 29 years, that's a long time. Yeah. Uh, everybody, uh, you know how everybody just gets all shaky and everything? Yeah. This one friend of mine said, look at this guy. He's not even nervous. And he <laughs> said, Ma, what's wrong with you? I'm just getting married. <laughs> what's the big deal <laughs> <laughs> that's where i'm kind of where i'm like i'm not nervous about marrying her like she is you've already been together for so long five years like I, I love her she's yeah. my person i want to spend the rest of my life with her what i'm nervous about is the the wet like having all eyes on us having the, the actual wedding that we have and having like close all the to families it. there yeah <laughs> that's what's making me nervous and like family i haven't met on her side and stuff like that yeah just don't worry about them worry about you and her 100 percent. yeah what you guys are doing at the moment yeah those guys are just there there to just witness. There. Yeah, they're, just they're like yeah. the police officers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was pretty funny, man. <laughs> that was so funny. And so yeah. how many kids did you guys have? Uh, seven. Wow. And then we adopted five. Oh. Wow. And you guys did ceremonies together, right? Like, did yeah. you lead them together? And, and yeah. She and came there? the first year I danced in 1999 in the Sundance. She came down and supported me and supported me. Once the Sundance was over, they asked for people uh, to come forward and make the pledge to dance. She went to the center pole too. And then she danced and, and became a Sundancer and pipe carrier. And, and the leader himself, Morris Crow, appointed her to be a woman's leader. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nobody, none of the... Not, none of the women had a meeting, chose her or nothing. He did. Mm -hmm. He appointed her to be a dancer, or to be a Sundance leader, wow. woman Sundance leader. Yeah. I wanted to ask with um, marriage, like the, what was what was the word? There was traditionally traditional, matched. Yeah, the traditionally matched. Is that 
common now? Like, was was that even common then? Is that something that happens now, or was that? Oh no, that that's don't that don't like yeah ago. that don't happen anymore. Yeah. That that was years ago. Because it sounds like it was a, a rare thing even when yeah. you guys got married. Yeah, and it was a rare thing when we got married, but they haven't been doing that since probably about the 1930s. Mm. Oh, okay. If not before. Uh, the church basically took over. The church here was built in 1939, and that's when all the traditional ceremonies sort of started going downhill mm. or being abolished. And that's just one of those traditional things that just never got revisited yeah. or re... Yeah. You know, no, you guys didn't bring it up again or practice it, essentially? Yeah. Yeah. When did you become chief? 1991. Okay. So, like, right when you married your wife. Or like, right uh, around when you met her-ish. Kind of. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, no. 1990. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. In September of 1990, the people chose me to be their chief. And how long were you chief for? Nine years. And in that time, I I would like to hear, because I've heard that you had a big hand in the BC Oil and Gas Commission being formed. Can you tell us a bit about that story and like kind of start at the beginning? Because I don't really know much. Matt oh. just kind of mentioned it in passing at the sweat on Sunday. Ah. Uh. And uh, suggested that I ask you about it. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I think it was in 1995, someplace in there, uh, this, this guy, I'm going to get comfy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this guy uh, named Mike Ray, um, Bought what used to be a little store just down the road here, about a couple kilometers, called uh, uh, Ken's Place. It was just a, a general store. He bought it. He was an Englishman, and him and his wife ran it. And, uh, um, like, Ken had passed away suddenly heart attack or something. So his wife sold the store and Mike bought it. And I used we used to go there for lunch all the time. Cuz he was he made really good bacon and eggs and bangers. <laughs> <laughs> or uh eggs and bangers, they were really good. Anyways, we'd go for there uh, we'd go there for lunch and I'd sit and talk with him. And uh, I found out that he was once, he worked with the Arabs as, I think, a negotiator for some company. And made a lot of big deals. I mean, the smallest deal I, I believe he made was worth $60 million. Oh, wow. Okay. And he heard us of what we wanted to do here at West Mobley and where we wanted to get to. And finally, one day, he made us an offer that he would become our executive manager of the nation and he'll try to get us to where we go we're going and my political ideas at the time was that uh, I had already been talking with the, the local ministries the, the district offices um, that you that make land use decisions that they need to talk with us because their decisions are impacting our uh, treaty right to uh, utilize the land and its resources. 
and basically in the end we're not getting anything out of it. So you're just destroying our land and we can't use it. So we would like to have a say so in what happens. Well, everybody hummed and hawed, especially the government. Uh, industry wanted to have something happening because their revenue is going to be impacted upon. And uh, so ad hocly, the government tried to uh, make everything right under the urging of industry. And finally, Halfway River went to court over con uh, meaningful consultation. And they went to the Supreme Court of Canada and they won. And it said that the federal, both federal and provincial governments has to consult First Nations people, especially treaty people. And uh, even though gov industry doesn't, ha doesn't need to consult, but uh, government are the people that make decisions for industry to rape and pillage. <laughs> In quotations. <laughs> yeah. And uh, um, so in 1997, or yeah, I think it was 97, um, we started negotiations with uh, energy mines and petroleum resources. They were the ones that came to the table and wanting to negotiate agreement. So we agreed, we, we made an agreement with them. And in the fall, in October of 1998, uh, we finally concluded our agreement. Uh, our consultation agreement and that's when the OGC was born. Uh, the agreement was negotiated uh, by West Moberly and Fort Nelson. And in the wings was Halfway River First Nation. Uh, they, didn't, they weren't really involved in the negotiation or anything like this, but they were keeping tabs on everything that was going on. And uh, the chief of Halfway, which was the late Bernie Medici, was pretty interested in what was going on, and a lot of times he followed my lead. Uh, and uh, at the last minute, he too, he liked the agreement that he said he'd sign it. So three First Nations signed it, Fort Nelson, Halfway River, and West Moberly. The other people didn't. Uh, Prophet River, Blueberry, Doig, and Soto uh, didn't want to sign it for whatever reason. But anyways, so what we were trying to do with that agreement <coughs> was uh, implement our treaty rights uh, in regards to the harvesting of natural resources. And uh, because after, after we had oil and gas hooked, the next people that were sitting in line waiting for us to start, and we already had one meeting, was uh, Ministry of Forests. That was before they became Flinro. And uh, they were starting to come to the table and wanting to uh, do the same thing, uh, negotiate a consultation agreement because they were losing like crazy in the courts. Mm. Um, and it was all because what they thought was meaningful consultation is not meaningful consultation in accordance to the courts. 
meaningful consultation is two groups agreeing what consultation is, not one side telling the other side, this is what consultation is. Like, did some of the negotiations get pretty heated? Like, uh, To some degree, yeah. I, I, I imagine that would happen, but uh, Mike Ray was our negotiator with uh, the Energy, Oil, and Gas Commission, okay. or the uh, Energy, Mines, and Petroleum Resources. He was our negotiator, so he was used to sitting at that table, so I just let him go. He'd just come back, tell us what's going on, and we'd give him direction as to which way to go and what to agree to and what not to agree to okay. uh, when he goes back to the table again. Um, but yeah, it was in 19, October of 1998 that the uh, Oil and Gas Commission was born. Wow. And it was all because of th that agreement we negotiated with them. And roughly six months later, the people wanted to change the custom system that we were uh, under. They wanted to change it to an election system. And, uh, and I told them, well, according to the uh, rules, you need to ask me to step down. Because I'm not going to step down if you don't ask me. So they did, by way of letter. And I said, okay, you guys can have your election. Then they wanted me to run, and I told them, no, I'm not going to run. Yeah, because in the custom system, uh, there was 100% support. Uh, Decision-making was by consensus. The whole nation had to agree, and we all went together. And I told them, you turn this into an election system, you'll always have 49% against you. And that's the way it's been for 20 years now. That says a lot for just even what we're going through, just politically in yeah. general. <laughs> so, yeah. so after uh. that, is that when Roland Wilson... Yep. Into the flow. So he's been here as chief since that yeah. system was in place. Okay. Yeah. And so, but I, I support him. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, he does a good job. Yeah. We had him on the podcast, yeah. I think, for a third or fourth episode. And yeah. I just, I yeah. love chatting with him. Yeah. And I feel like we just scratched the surface. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, even even with George, we I can know. tell you right now, it's just scratching the surface and we'll want to do more episodes. Yes. With him. I think on that note... Yeah, uh, we have a question that we ask all of our guests, um, and it's, what does reconciliation mean to you? Leave us the hell alone and go home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so funny. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know. That is, in my opinion, a big fancy word mm -hmm. that is never going to be fulfilled, no matter what. Because somebody in that, in those big halls of uh, wisdom, if you want to call it that, will find a loophole because that's all they do. That's what government does. Uh, find loopholes in order to continue governing the way they do. It'll, it'll, there'll never be a level playing field, I don't think. Um, How do we heal? Yeah, in your opinion, for us as Canadian citizens mm -hmm. as a whole, what do you think... I mean, this is a big question, but what do you think needs to be done amongst residents of Canada? I think everybody needs to be informed of uh, who we are as individuals. What are our beliefs? What are what is our customs? 
uh, who are we? And because uh, if we don't understand one another, this is going to continue. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to understand one another. Uh, it's one of the things our late leader, Marsh Crow, said before he passed on. He said, during the dance, I want you guys to pray, pray for world peace. Um, and to have world peace is to understand one another because we're all humans. You cut your skin, no matter what color you are, you cut your skin, you got red blood coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a lot more in common than we think. Yeah. Uh, and if you really sit down and look at the way things are done, like the sweat, for example. We're not that far off of what the churches do. I actually was, I was thinking when I left, I was like, that to me felt like Sunday church. But like, I don't know, I went to a different kind of church growing up. So <laughs> like, yeah, but I was, like, I was raised a Catholic. The, the purpose, like the, I don't know, this the ceremonial aspect of it. It's still yeah. spirituality, right? Yes. There's yeah. still a yes. spiritual side, and that's where yeah. it relates. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing. Everybody's got to realize, no matter which way they pray, there's still only one God. There's not a whole bunch of them. There's still just one. There always was. And generally, everyone prays in the same way. Yeah. Another, yeah. Right? Well, there... This is something that I always talk about. I, I always say too, is that uh, the Creator n knew that the people of Earth that He created are not going to be all the same. They are going to believe in different ways, even amongst the same nations or same races. That's why the Creator taught everybody different ways to pray. And a good example is the way churches. Look at how many different church types of churches mm -hmm. there are. You got Catholics, Anglicans, Baptists, and so on, all the way down the line. Yeah. And in First Nations, we have different kind of ceremonies. We have sweats that are different. But they all do one thing. They all pray to the same God. And every one of us as individual has a right to choose which way is our way. You know, which, which way is your way from the heart you choose from the heart and uh, that was one of the greatest gifts the creator ever gave man or people of earth was the gift of choice because nobody but nobody can make a choice for you they can force you but it's still not your choice, mm -hmm. you know? Nobody can talk you into it because somewhere down the line, you still got to make that choice. Uh, it's, like, it's like bringing a case of beer to an alcoholic and, and asking them, let's have a drink. And he says, no, I don't drink anymore. And he keeps bugging him, come on. Have a drink with me for old time's sake. Remember when we used to drink and blah, 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 blah? And eventually the guy says, okay, well, I'll have one with you. Right there, he just made a choice. Mm. All that guy did was provide him 
the opportunity to make a choice. And we have to choose as individuals, how do we pray to the Creator? How do we pray, period? It's not necessarily worshiping, but it's, uh, it's praying. And you gotta pray from the heart and believe in that prayer from your heart. And uh, and they will help. See, that's our come. Despite what the churches had done to my people through residential school and everything, I, I don't believe in their ways. But they do help people. Some people, for them. It is the right way. Hmm. And, and they don't have all bad people. Uh, not every one of them are like that. Mm -hmm. And it's those ones that I support. Those ones that lead people in prayer that I support. But one of the things I must say, I've been to Europe. I've seen there are many different kind of churches. And I've seen the way they make them fancy, lined with silver and gold. Those people are in for a disappointment when they pass on. It's not silver and gold in heaven. It's paradise. And paradise is pristine. Wilderness, mm. forests, animals, uh, fields in abundance. It's not lined with gold. You know, they don't have streets of silver. They don't have diamonds hanging, crystals hanging off the ceilings. Everything, that's, our, that's the one thing about our way with the sweat is to be humble. Look at Jesus. Look how humble he was. He was raised by a poor family and he lived among the, in poverty. And yet he was the richest man alive. That's the way heaven is. These churches, that's man-made. Mm -hmm. That's man's idea. That's not paradise. You mentioned at the sweat that every person has minimum of nine spirits. Approximately, yeah. Okay. And that they're there, they just might be dormant. Yeah. And you just need to awaken them yep. with prayer, right? Yeah. And it might take a, a few tries. I know in the, a sweat will do it. It's one way of doing it. Um, but I... I I think through a church you can do it too. I, I don't see why not. Um, I forgot to ask this earlier, but I was wondering, your was it your dad or your grandpa that told you that you were, is it a healer of children? Is that the term or what's the term? Uh, protector of children. Protector of children. Okay. And that there's some responsibility that comes with that, right? Yep. Yeah, there's some responsibility there. Uh, um, I don't really know how much of it I can talk about. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. 
Well, I just want to say that you've been around my child and I can see how you are with her and this is the way that you connected. Like I just almost want to cry <laughs> just thinking about it. <laughs> so how is she doing? Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I often wondered about her, how she's doing. Sorry, we just had a doctor's appointment yesterday, so I'm just a little bit more emotional. Oh, it's all right. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you for everything you've done for me. Oh, <laughs> you're <sorry>. welcome. <laughs> I'm so... <laughs> I'm going to have to say that again. Oh my gosh. Yeah, thank you for everything you've done, and I really appreciate everything that I've learned from you. And I'm really looking forward to having you in my life. And I'm just very grateful. Oh, thank you. She yeah, couldn't, she no could, problem. I she couldn't tell me much, but on, on Sunday, right after the sweat, she like immediately phoned me just to <laughs> say, you know, how great it was. And um so we're just we're just blowing smoke up George today, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but you're, you know, I, you're just a wonderful person, George. And, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Jenna constantly talks about you and she was very excited for us to come up as was I. And, um, yeah. again, I mean, we've only talked for an hour and a half, but there's so much more we want to ask you and mm -hmm. eventually we'll make, I know we'll uh, continue to talk to you and, and do another episode here, but thank you so much for, for allowing us to, to come my first time here in West Moberly um, mm. and, and to chat with you and for you to delve in on, on some things, uh, not only for us, but the listeners that are very curious as well mm -hmm. and the impact you've had on <laughs> Jenna, <laughs> yeah. a wonderful, positive <laughs> impact. So we'll have, to, we'll have right to take on. a picture in front of the lake. It's yeah. So pretty oh, out there. Yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's... Thank you, uh, George. Uh, thank yep. you so much. No problem. Let's end this with so Jenica. <laughs> okay. Make sure you guys subscribe to Before the Peace using your favorite podcast app or at energeticcity.ca slash podcasts.